Uh, thank you all for joining us this morning. I am Moel Kalaf. I'm a postdoctoral fellow and chair of the trainee committee at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. I hope everyone is healthy and safe at this time, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us on this virtual science seminar series brought to you by the BEATS research and radio team. Uh, today here we, uh, we are uh, uh, monitored by Dr. Uh, Emilio Alarcon, Hallie Arnett, and uh, I'm Mo here with you guys, all working from home now, but still continuing to bring science to the community. So uh, some housekeeping notes uh, before we get started. This seminar will be uh, 30 to 40 uh, uninterrupted uh, minutes uh, of uh, presentation, followed by 10 minutes of questioning. Today we have me, uh, Dr. Al Khalaf. Actually, I never say myself as Dr. Just Mo, uh, as your moderator. Uh, please keep your microphones and camera off during the presentation. If you have any issues connecting to the audio, you can connect by phone. Uh, the numbers here for Canada is 855-703-8985, and the meeting ID is, as you can see here, 321-517-779. And if you're from the U.S., the number to call is 877-853-5257. Uh, so for all questions, uh, please send them in a private chat to me. And uh, at the end of the presentation, I will ask Dr. Hammer all the questions uh, that you guys uh, have uh, sent over. Please, uh, if you can include your name, your title, your affiliation to a program or an institute, uh, it'll help me instead of saying Joe from uh, Wichita, Oklahoma is uh, asking this question. <laughs> So uh, all the seminars will be available uh, later on, uh, today or tomorrow, on the uh, Beats Research Radio YouTube channel. Please check our website or uh, Twitter for uh, release information. So uh, as you can see, today we have, uh, we have a seminar by uh, Dr. Hemmer. And uh, just as a sneak peek, we'll, uh, we're letting you know that uh, coming up next week, uh, we have another uh, beat seminar, uh, same time, uh, or actually, I think it's actually at 10 o'clock uh, next week. So keep that in mind, 10 o'clock next week on Monday, uh, we have Dr. Hassan Uludag, who uh, will be talking to us about designing uh, lipopolymers to deliver gene-based medicine. So uh, today, uh, today, I have the pleasure of moderating an exciting lecture by our guest speaker, guest speaker Dr. Eva Hammer. Uh, so as a brief introduction uh, for our speaker today, I'll just say that Dr. Hemmer is an assistant professor of materials chemistry at the University of Ottawa. She received her PhD in material science from Saarland University in Germany. Uh, during her PhD, she focused on the synthesis of uh, lanthanide oxides uh, and their decomposition to uh, lanthanide containing inorganic nanomaterials. This experience was further deepened during her postdoctoral studies when she worked on lanthanide doped nanoparticles for near-infrared bioimaging in Tokyo, University of Science in Japan. In 2013, she was awarded a Fedor Lenin Research Postdoctoral Fellowship from the Alexander Van Humboldt Foundation to work in the groups of, the, uh, of Professor Vitron and Laguerre at the INRS EMT University de Quebec to develop nanothermometers used on upconverting uh, nanoparticles. In 2016, she joined the University of Chemistry, uh, the Department of Chemistry and, uh, and Biomolecular Sciences here at the University of Ottawa, where her research will focus on the design of novel lanthanide-based nanocarriers for applications range ranging from bioimaging to solar technologies. So thank you so much, Dr. Hemmer for joining us this morning. Welcome, and please take the virtual podium of this seminar. Thank you so much to all the organizers. It's really my pleasure to be here. It's exciting. It's a completely new format. So luckily, I had a little bit of practice with Zoom teaching over the past days and almost weeks, but I hope this will all work out. So sharing here my slides, is it OK? Okay, perfect. Good. So um, what I'm actually planning to do here today is to give you an introduction on lanthanide-based nanomaterials and how we can use them in biomedicine, in particular beyond just like regular bioimaging. 
but what I also would like to do is to show you a couple of um, opportunities and cases from the literature that are really great, but also at the same time showing where we still have struggles and challenges and where the research has to be um, going on. So this will not just like showcasing what we are currently doing in my lab, but I, I would rather give you a kind of an insight into this research and where it is and what we can do and where we still have to overcome it. So to start with, um, if you're looking here at all these different pictures of items and tools and, and methods, for instance, photodynamic therapy, here we have already something that looks really like medical application, also optical bioimaging, or we have here an MRI. So all these very diverse applications, they are actually possible thanks to lanthanide. And this can be done either by being based on the optical properties of those materials, or we can use their magnetic properties. So let me quickly introduce to you that may not be that familiar with lanthanides, what are we talking here about? So we are talking about the four F elements, which are the rare earth, including lanthanides and yttrium. And in general, you will find these always like put under the periodical table and many people don't care about them. But actually, as you can see it here, this is how we should plot from a lanthanide perspective, the periodical table and where the four F elements should be arranged. And you can see that they are clearly standing out of the periodical table and so are their properties. So they have some very interesting optical properties that range from up conversion, down conversion, down shifting, but also magnetic properties. And both optics and mag magnetism of the lanthanides is based on the fact that they are actually four F elements. So on their specific electron configuration. Today, I mainly would like to focus on the optical properties of these lanthanide ions. And we are talking about the three plus lanthanide ions. So the nice and neat thing is that we can, with the emission from these lanthanide ions, we can span the full range from UV via visible and into the near infrared um, spectral region. So for instance, you can have some very classical approach where you use relatively high energy light, like UV excitation, in order to trigger the emission of visible light. And this classical approach of using high energy light to trigger lower energy light can also be shifted into the near infrared spectral region. What is a very specific um, aspect about these lanthanide ions that is that we can also use low energy light that comes from the near infrared spectral region in order to trigger high energy light. And this might be something that is counterintuitive because how can you generate more energy out of low energy? So this is a process that is called up conversion. And in the next couple of slides, I also would like to explain to you what is going on there. But before going there, let's have a look at all these NIR, NIR, NIR mentioned here. So there's a lot of focus pushed on, this, on, on the light that is actually in the near infrared spectral region. And there's a reason for this, because near infrared light falls in the so-called biological transparency window. So what does this mean? If you have a look at this um, figure he shown here on the right, we have the optical loss of human skin as a function of the wavelength. So if you are in the visible or in the UV range, we see that this curve is really going up consequently in the visible and then the UV, you will not have a lot of light that can penetrate through biological tissue. However, if we are in this region of the biological window, we have these minimum of the loss coefficient. That means we can penetrate deeper into biological tissue when using near infrared light that is either from this first biological window, the second or the third biological window. And the reason for this is that we are having less scattering and also less absorption of near infrared light by the biological tissue which results in the fact that we can penetrate deeper up to a centimeter range into tissue when compared to classical uv vis light. Another advantage of near infrared light is that in contrast to UV light that is high in energy, we have much lower phototoxicity. So if you are shining with your UV lamp on a, on a sample or on a biological tissue, after some time you may induce photo damage, similar to sunburn. However, near infrared light is much less harmful in that regard. And also for the probes that are actually capable to be excited with near infrared light or to emit near infrared light. So as we will see, we speak today about nanomaterials that are inorganic, 
So in contrast to organic dyes, although under neon bright excitation, we have a much higher photostability. So if you have an organic dye and you shine too long UV excitation on it, after some point, you will observe photo bleaching and you cannot use your sample anymore. Okay, so neon infrared light is really interesting for the biomedical application because we can penetrate deeper into it. And we have also in terms of bioimaging, we get better resolution and um, this in comparison to the use of UV this light. However, there is one drawback of the lanthanide ions. So all the optical properties of the lanthanide ions are actually based on transitions in, that are based on FF transitions. So this is because we are talking here about the four F elements. And per se, these are forbidden. So we should not observe them in principle. Luckily, forbidden does not mean that they are never happening. So we can make them partially allowed. And this is happening by playing some tricks. So one is to use actually a ligand scaffold that you put around your lanthanide ion. For instance, here we have one lanthanide ion and there is another one and we have then a ligand scaffold around in order to allow our lanthanide ions to give the emission that we want. But today we will not talk about molecules. Today we will talk about inorganic material. So an alternative is that you're having a host lattice, a crystalline material, and it is crystalline material, we are doping our active lanthanide ion. So this gives us like lanthanide three plus dopants in a host lattice. And if we have an um, upconversion process in a nanoscale um, size, we are talking here about upconverting nanoparticles or UCMP. So again, as I mentioned before, the higher photostability, this is in particular true also, even if we would have UV excited lanthanide ions in here, because we are having inorganic host materials, we definitely have a very good photostability. Another advantage of nanoparticles is that they can act as carriers of multiple functionalities. So they can be optic, they can be magnetic at the same time. Um, we can also load the surface of those nanoparticles with various functionalities to make them, for instance, targeting a specific disease, or we can load them with the drug, and then it can be a delivery agent. So these are the interesting aspects of nanoparticles in, in the biomedical context. Of course, there are challenges. So I mentioned that we may be able to do targeting, but it sounds much easier than it is. So indeed, targeting remains one of the big challenges in nanomedicine in general, and not only for the lanthanide-based nanomaterial. The same holds true for not very well understood nanobio interactions. So how can we force our materials to go where we want them? What are our toxicity concerns? How long will these nanostructures stay in the body? But those two aspects are really a general um, challenge in all of the, of the um, nanomaterials. So let's get back to be more specific for our lanthanide-based material. And what type of host letters can be used? So here I'm, have, I'm giving you four of the state-of-the-art materials, and they are all having the same general formula, where we have M is a alkali metal, RE is the rare earth, and F, so for fluorine. So we have fluorides here. And for instance, sodium gadolinium fluoride, those highlighted in green, it can crystallize in two different crystalline host lattice, either in the hexagonal lattice, also called beta, or in the cubic lattice, also called alpha. Now, for optics, the hexagonal host material is the one that we run because it's giving us more intense emissions when it comes to upconversion. In contrast, we have lately found that if we are having the cubic phase, this is actually a better MRI contrast agent. Let me quickly draw your attention to lithium atrium fluoride. This is also in the same family, even though the structure is very different. It's neither hexagonal nor cubic, but when doping it with thulium, this is a very good combination if you are aiming for UV blue upconversion emission. And this is something that we will see in, in a couple of later, in some later slides as well. So, but what do I want to say though? So it shows you that when we synthesize these materials, it is also very important to keep in mind the crystalline phase the size, of course, and we, in particular, we have to be selective. So we need to have um, synthetic methods that allow us to um, specifically and selectively design either the hexagonal or the cubic, depending on what we want to apply them. For. So let me also now get back a bit more to the optics. And this slide is in particular for those of you who may be more familiar with organic dyes or with quantum dots. Because there are some very important differences between these different classes of fluorophores. 
So if we start and having a look for the organic dyes, like for instance, tip C, in this case, we see that for both excitation and also for emission, we are having very broad um, bands. And on top of this, the spectral difference or the how much there's a shift in wavelengths between the emission and the excitation is not very large. Something that is characteristic for quantum dots is that actually the emission wavelengths or the color of the quantum dots is dependent on the size. So if we tune size, then we can tune the emission intensity. So none of these is happening in case of the lanthanide. In case of lanthanides, we are having very sharp emission bands and also excitation bands in contrast to organic dyes. And in contrast to quantum dots, for the lanthanide, the emission color is completely independent of the size of our nanoparticle. So the question is what actually determines the emission and excitation wavelengths of the lanthanide ions? And the answer is found in this energy level diagram that we are seeing here. It's the so-called Dieke diagram. And what we are having is the energy levels for each of the lanthanide ions. They are given on top of it. And I have highlighted for you in different colors the energy levels that are actually important for the specific emitting, uh, for the specific emitted color. So if we pick, for instance, erbium, it will be these regions here that will generate us green light when it's going down to the ground state. Alternatively, we can also use this energy level and it would give us emission in the near infrared light. So, but how is photo up conversion? So I hope this video will play and because it shows very nicely what we are actually seeing here. So in photon up conversion, we have a stepwise process where you have one low energy photon that is coming and it is bringing this little guy up. Here it goes to the first step and then it is waiting for a second photon to come that brings it up to a higher energy level. And then it's up here, so it collected some energy by using small, several portions of small energy. And then it is jumping down, releasing all its energy that overall is then, of course, a higher energy than the energy of each photon that was used in a multi-photon process. So if we look at this in a more um, physical way, looking here again at our energy levels, what is happening is we can use 980 nanometer light that matches the near infrared region. And there's a perfect match in the energy levels here. And there's another one and another one and another one. So we can use multiple photons of 980 nanometer light in order to bring up the erbium to an excited state. Unfortunately, this is not a very efficient process but we can overcome this. So if we are looking here at our scheme of the upconverting nanoparticle, we see that at the one hand side, we have the activators, which is the erbium that is giving us the emission. But on the other hand side, we are adding on top of this, a co-dropant, a sensitizer, which for instance is ytterbium three plus. And the reason for using ytterbium three plus is that the energy level of ytterbium is a perfect match with this energy level here of erbium. So we can also excite ytterbium, and ytterbium is much better in being excited than erbium. And this is then followed by an energy transfer to erbium, so that here as well, we end up in the higher level. Once being excited, then there may be some non-radiative relaxation down to an emitting state. And in the specific case from erbium, once having reached from these two here, this is from where we generate green emission, or this one here is from where we generate the red emission. So we can, we can trigger then the UV visible. So even UV is possible by going into higher levels of conversion emission. And to show you this, this can be pretty, um, give you pretty bright emissions so we can even use these nanoparticles and excite them with a handhold near infrared laser diode here we have the very characteristic green emission of erbium that is doped in a hexagonal nanoparticle if we dope it into a cubic nanoparticle the emission is more like reddish so I think the red emission becomes more strong if we choose thulium instead of erbium we are getting a very characteristic blue emission so the question was what determines the emission color of the lanthanide. So it is clearly these different energy levels that determine it. And we have then to pick the right lanthanide ion in order to obtain the emission that we are aiming for. 
Besides the up conversion, the same erbium doped nanomaterials can also give us near infrared emission. And this is by having this energy transfer here over to erbium. And then there would be some non radiative um, relaxation down to, the, to, to this level here from where it then can have near infrared emission. So it's a kind of an all rounder. You can have up conversion, but also near infrared emission. To give you again an example of why we really want to have neon red light instead of UV light in excitation. So I'm showing you here an example where we obtained some zebrafish embryos from our collaborators in biology that were incubated with upconverting nanoparticles. And then here, this zebrafish larvae is uh, excited with UV light, but our nanoparticles are not emitting at all with um, UV excitation. So all this blue emission that you're seeing here is just like fluorescence, autofluorescence of the biological tissue. So there is nothing that comes actually from our optical growths. And this shows you that there is a really like a big challenge of how to get away from autofluorescence and from the background um, emission when you're using the UV excitation. If we switch to two photon excitation um, confocal microscope, then in this case here, what we see is, yeah, it's getting better because now we only have the green emission of our nanoparticles. But what we also see is by using this two photon excitation, we have a lot of background noise. So this is not ideal yet. And if we just go to very simple, direct near infrared excitation with this stepwise process, then we see in this image here that we have much less background noise. And only where we have this emission intensity here, this is actually a false color image. So it was color green because it's the erbium emission. The raw data are just like a, spray, a gray scale. But we see now exactly where the nanoparticles are. And how do we know that this is nanoparticle emission and not whatever kind of background? Well, we have a hyperspectral microscope where on these data cubes that we are obtaining, we can go on these different regions of the image that we obtain. And then at each of those targets here, we can obtain the spectral information. And this is really the fingerprint of the green erbium emission. So we are sure that all these signals are really coming from our upconverting nanoparticle. All right, but we wanted to talk about biomedical applications that are beyond bioimaging. And there are three of them that I would like to, to pick today. One is bioassays and then photodynamic therapy and truck delivery counts a bit together. It's the same idea. And last but not least, we will talk a little bit about nanothermometry. But let's start with bioassays. So what is happening here? It's very often that we develop or the community aims to develop these bioassays that are based on threat, first the resonance energy transfer. What we are happen, having here is again, our upconverting nanoparticle that under near infrared excitation is for instance, emitting green and red if we have erbium. And we modify this with a probe molecule. Now, if we have in our solution, a acceptor molecule that is also modified with the capture. So this is another fluorophore. Then only if we have an analyte close by, what happens is that they will click together. If we don't have an analyte, this acceptor die and the nanoparticle will stay far away from each other and our upconverting nanoparticle will just give us the regular emission. Yet if this clicking happens, then the upconverting nanoparticle and the dye here is getting in close enough distance and we can have some luminescent resonance energy transfer, which results in the fact that the emission wavelengths of the upconverting nanoparticle that matches very well the excitation or the absorbance of our um, acceptor here will be quenched. So we lose, for instance, the green emission and we trigger the acceptor. And this is then how you can detect your analyte. Just the more analyte you will have, you will get a stronger emission. But there's a problem. So, and, and even so, the advantage of the use of upconverting nanoparticles is again in the fact that we can use near infrared light for excitation, which results in much less autofluorescence and background. Thus, we can per se get much nicer signal to noise ratios. A problem comes clear when we look at the difference to uh, regular systems or established systems. So very often in bio and analytics, we are using dye molecules or protons in these red pairs. So this is a really often applied concept. But here we have one donor and we have one acceptor. So it's pretty easy to make calculations and to understand how everything is happening. 
If we move, for instance, into other novel approaches where we have, for instance, a quantum dot that is modified with acceptor molecules on the surface, and then if in, um, sorry, um, connectors on the surface, and with an analyte, we bind several dye molecules on the surface. What is happening is that each quantum dot is again one emitter, one donor, but we do not know the number of how many acceptors do we really have on the surface. So this becomes already more difficult to, um, to have something quantitative. Now, when we look at our upconverting nanoparticles, it's getting even more challenging because here we have our donor and on the other side, we have the acceptor and the FRED process is really distance dependent. Only if the acceptor is close to the donor, we can have this FRED process. But which distance do we now have to take? Is it so in our nanoparticle, each nanoparticle is not only one donor, because now we have to count all these many lanthanide ions that are doped into the nanoparticle. So each of them is an emitter. So we have an unknown of how many donors we have, and we have an unknown of how many acceptors we have. So do we calculate the distance from the dye to the surface of the nanoparticle, or from the dye to a lanthanide ion that is in the core of the nanoparticle? So this is a difficult question. And also, as Fred is distance dependent, we know that most likely it is um, not happening at distances that are larger than five nanometer. So if you have a nanoparticle that is like a typical size range of 20, 30, 40 nanometer, only the outer five nanometer will really interact with those acceptors here. All the other nanoparticles in the volume, they will not participate in Fred. So this has two consequences. One is that threat in upconverting nanoparticles is really dependent on the size of our upconverting nanoparticles. And this is, for instance, a nice study by the group of Uteraj Genger, who showed this really nicely. But there is another effect, which is that we are having this volume here of all these lanthanide emitters, and they are just emitting and emitting, and they may totally overshadow the emission or the quenching of the emission of those lanthanide ions that are actually involved in the fret, which makes it challenging to have a good signal to noise ratio. So in order to understand this better, and um, so I have to mention that fret processes in upconverting nanoparticles have been studied a lot, but I am daring to say that they are by far completely understood. So we try to contribute this by preparing different architectures of just like simple nanoparticles doped with lanthanide ions, or by having them with a protective shell that is undoped, so adding more spacer between the donor and the acceptor, or having no lanthanide ions in the inside at all and only having lanthanide active ions on the surface. So we try to understand what is happening here. There were some surprising um, insights. I will not go into today. What I would like to focus is focusing on the simple donor acceptor pair here, where we used a, uh, the donor is a, a dye labeled on a DNA strand, and this was then attached to the nanoparticle. So I would like to show you how we can overcome this problem of low signal to noise ratio due to all the background emission of the lanthanide ions that are not involved in FRET. And therefore, let's first have a look again at the um, energy levels, what is happening here. So our nanoparticles are excited. We bring them up into the excited level. If we have a FRED process, there will be some non-radiative energy transfer to the LUMO of the dye. And then we get down, relax, and have the emission of our um, acceptor. This is a FRED process. So there's absolutely no radiative emission involved in the, in, in, on the erbium side in perfect FRED. However, if we have the emission from the upconverting nanoparticle and it is then reabsorbed by the dye, in this case, we would also see a quenching of the emission of the upconverting nanoparticle, but it would not be a FRET process. So in order to know whether we have really a FRET process or not, we have to look at the luminescence decay of our excited state of the erbium ion, which is the lifetime of the excited state. So if we have this FRED process, what is happening is that this excited state here will be shortened. We will have a shortening of the lifetime of our erbium ion. And here it is also important to mention that typically the lifetimes in lanthanides are very long. They are micro to milliseconds in comparison to dyes or quantum dots where we are more talking about um, nanoseconds or even picoseconds. So they are really long. 
So now what we can do is in our example where we have the donor and the acceptor, and one thing is, well, let's have a look how the donor is actually quenched. And this graph shows the decay of the green erbium emission. You have also on the y-axis the photoluminescence. So if you look at the intensity here, you see that with or without any of the dye on the surface, the intensity is pretty much the same. Also, the lifetime is pretty much the same. So we cannot clearly see any donor quenching in this, probably because there is there are too many lanternite ions in the center of the nanoparticles not involved in FRET that are shedding over everything that is involved in FRET. But what we can do now, instead of looking at the lifetime and the decay of the erbium emission, we are now looking at the decay of the sensitized emission. So we are now looking at what is actually happening with our um, FRET, how does it, with, with our dye, how is this behaving? And here you can clearly see in black, we have the background with no, no dye at all. And then once we have the dye on the, our upconverting nanoparticles, you see a clear intensity increase. So we can relatively easy and with a very good signal to noise ratios, the, in, the acceptor um, emission can be detected. And what we can also see here is that this results in the prolongation of the um, lifetime of the, of the dye. So this is a very nice approach, looking at acceptor sensitization instead of donor crunching in order to obtain better signal-to-noise ratios for your bioassay. Yet a word of warning, so this approach of using the increase in acceptor lifetime only works out if our acceptor lifetime in absence of the nanoparticle or our donor is actually shorter than the donor lifetime. So for most of the dyes and the quantum dust, this works because, as I said, our upconverting nanoparticle has lifetimes of micro to milliseconds. Dyes and quantum dots is more in nano to pico. So we can easily see if suddenly for the dye or the quantum dot, we get a much longer lifetime. This makes sense. And this is a good part about it. Okay, so far for bioassay. So using the infrared light, we can improve on auto fluorescence and using the acceptor photoluminescence can also help us here really in getting better signal to noise ratios. And in the literature, there are some beautiful um, real life applications actually that we find. However, drawbacks, of course, what do we do if we cannot re um, rely on the emission from our uh, sensitized acceptor, but if you have to look at the donor, then we really struggle. Also, threat processes still have to be understood in a much better way. But let's move forward to this group of, of applications that are actually grouped together. And why? Because both of them are actually near infrared excited um, uh, processes. For instance, a remote controlled photochemical process when we are talking about photodynamic therapy or a remotely controlled truck release. We use our near infrared light in order to trigger these processes. When talking about photodynamic therapy in general, we have light and we have a photosensitizer. And under irradiation with this specific light, the photosensitizer becomes activated, ultimately resulting in the generation of free radicals and single oxygen species so that we have the means to kill, for instance, a cancer cell. Now, if we have in this case here, you have a photosensitizer that needs, for instance, UV or blue light to be excited or even green light such as, for instance, CE6 as a photosensitizer. It has the biggest absorption here in the blue, but also some in the red. So if you would use um, this light on a patient with a tumor under the skin, we could not reach it efficiently because UV and visible light cannot penetrate through the biological tissue. So the idea is here to penetrate through by using near and red light, and then locally where we have our upconverting nanoparticles, we generate the UV or visible light that is needed to activate these rust generating processes. So the spectra shown here are an example where we have upconverting nanoparticles that were modified with C6 as a photosensitizer. And these shaded ones are the absorbance of the C6 and then the lines are the photoluminescence of the nanoparticle. And what we can see when zooming in into the red region, which is where we have a very nice overlap between upconversion um, that is emitted and the absorbance of the photosensitizer, we see that comparing the green graph that is for nanoparticles only, 
with the blue one that has the CE6 on the surface, we nicely see this quenching of the um, emission, which indicates us that we have some um, transfer to the photosensitizer, and consequently, we have some potential for ROS generation. So in this study, it was more focused on the nanoparticle architectures, and we did not look into any biological effects. However, I would like to show you a nice example from the literature where we have these upconverting nanoparticles here that are doped with thulium. And maybe you remember I said that thulium is actually very good if we want to have blue or UV emission. So what the researchers have done, they decorated these upconverting nanoparticles with small titania nanoparticles. And titania is a photocatalyst that can be activated on the UV light. So now the UV light that is emitted from the thulium can trigger a uh, photocatalytic effect in titania. On top of that, they also decorated these nanoparticles with um, hypochrylin A, which is a photosensitizer that is blue light sensitive. So thulium also emitting blue light, we now have a second option to trigger some ROS generation. So this is a dual photosensitizer based on two different wavelengths emitted from our upconverting nanoparticles. And the idea here is that by having taking or taking advantage of both emission wavelengths, we can actually boost the efficiency of our um, photodynamic agent. And it was indeed then shown, they also added some targeting ligands that they could successfully induce some cancer cell apoptosis. So this is the principle of photodynamic therapy. Let's talk a little bit about drug release. And um, here, again, we have the near infrared excited um, activity. And ideally, we want to have this remote controlled drug release that can even more ideally be switched on off in a specific location at a specific time point as needed. A very much simpler way is to monitor drug release using upconverting nanoparticles. So for instance, we can have a carrier that could be a liposome and that is filled with green emitting upconverting nanoparticles. We have erbium, so green emitters under 980 nanometer excitation. Now, if we would also have doxorubicin as a model drug under near infrared excitation, this is not showing any emission. But if we bring the nanoparticles and the dox both together in this lipo carrier, what we have is that actually doxorubicin is absorbing in a wavelength range that very nicely overlaps with the emission of the upconverting nanoparticle. So consequently, if we have them in close enough distance together, we see this quenching here. The green curve is only the upconverting nanoparticles. The red one is when we have the dox close by. So we see that this green emission of the nanoparticle is actually being quenched. So on the opposite, this means if we now have a drug release because of a time-induced um, dispersion out of the lipo carrier, we will restore the um, green emission of the nanoparticles because the dox is not close enough anymore in order to induce any quenching process. Of course, there are some difficulties with this approach here because first of all, it is time-induced, so it's not a on-off, on-off for drug release. And also, if we want to monitor here the um, drug release by using this green emission, well, I said before, green emission is not near infrared. We need near infrared light to really penetrate through biological tissue. And this also includes that if we have a probe inside, we do not only need near infrared light to penetrate in to activate, but we also need near infrared light to get out to be detected. So there's room for improvement. And um, one way how this is, for instance, be done, if you're looking at the literature, it's like you will find uh, coating this mesoporous silica on top of these upconverting nanoparticles. And then these pores, they actually give us room to be loaded with a drug. So for instance, we can load it with a doxorubicin, but we want to avoid that the doxorubicin or the drug is like released too early and not on demand. So what was done in this work by this research group here is that they added a ruthenium complex that acts like a gate blocking these pores. So the dox cannot get out unless we use near infrared light to excite our nanoparticle that is emitting blue light because there is thulium doped into it. And then what is happening is that this blue light is actually cleaving the ruthenium complex so that it opens the gate and the dox can then get out. So this is a very elegant way how one can really on-off trigger the drug release. So the 
positive aspect here definitely are this, this remote control to have over a local region where you want to have the treatment with the drug on demand and we can use photoluminescence-based monitoring. However, there are of course also some challenges that people are working on at the moment to overcome. So for instance, loading of drugs, it might sound simple, but sometimes there are challenges. Like for instance, how do you bind it on the surface of your nanoparticle without modifying the drug molecule, which could um, result in the fact that it's not FDA approved anymore, or it could even kill the um, effic efficacy of the, of the drug. So maybe it's not working anymore as a drug. But from a much more basic point of view, what we also have to consider is that this light that is needed for the photosensitization, it comes from our upconverting nanoparticle acting as the activator. So therefore, we have the near infrared excitation and the upconverted emission. And looking at the quantum field, which is the number of photons that are emitted, in comparison to number of photons that we need for excitation, the problem is that quantum yield and up conversion is very low. And if you have people in the audience that are coming from molecular fluorophores or from quantum dots, I'm even shy to tell you how low it is. Well, it can be typically in the range of 1% in terms of quantum yield. So this is really a problem because if not enough light is generated to sensitize the, the photosensitizer, then the, the efficiency of the ROS generation can be very low. So what people are working on is like new upconverting nanoparticle design, boosting the upconver the upconversion quantum yield. But even assessment of quantum yield is not that easy because we do not have any commercial standards that could be used in order to compare intensities. So if you want to get information about the quantum yield of your nanoparticle, you actually need an integrating sphere and perform um, absolute measurements of, of the quantum yield. But to end this chapter here with a positive note, so there are applications where the low quantum yield actually is less of a challenge. So for instance, when we are looking at bioimaging, or we only rely on being able to detect the signal where it doesn't matter what is the quantum yield, then we are completely fine. Because as long as our eyes can see the signal, or as long as we are having a detector that is able to detect the signal, we can still use these upconverting nanoparticles. Okay, so let's now switch to a third application, um, the possible application that is actually nanothermometry, where we want to use the um, emission of the nanoparticles as a function that changes as a function of temperature. And this allows us then to gain some information about local temperature, for instance, in a tumor, or when we are doing a, a photothermal therapy and we want to control what is the temperature that is applied. So as already briefly said, lanternite de um, emission depends on temperature. So for instance, you can have a change in spectral change uh, position or your peak ratio can change or the bandwidth or the lifetime can change as a function of the temperature. So all these features that change with temperature can be used in nanothermometry. And professors Danny Hake and Pion Sovitone, they are kind of the fathers of nanothermometry. So the idea behind is that many diseases actually come with thermal singularities. And if we could use those for early diagnosis, that would be a new diagnostic tool. So the question is, how can we use upconverting nanoparticles to measure the temperature, ideally even at a subcellular level? So what um, they have shown in the very, very early example of nanothermometry is that we can use the spectral features of erbium um, that are temperature dependent. So here we zoom in, this is only the green emission. And to remind you, here we have again the energy levels and the green emission is coming from those two energy levels here, the 2H11 half and the 4S3 half. They are very close to each other and they are so close to each other that if you are giving a little bit of higher temperature, that is like a booster in energy and you would rather populate the higher level of those two than the lower one. And depending on which one you have higher, more, uh, more population of excited states, of course, then the emission intensity um, ratio between those two peaks will change. And this is exactly what we are seeing here. When increasing the temperature, you have a relative increase of this transition here, this emission peak here, in comparison to that one here. So HeLa cells were incubated with upconverting nanoparticles and they were put on a stage and then there was some heat applied through an applied voltage. So 
But how do we know this intracellular temperature? Well, the upconversion spectra were recorded from the nanoparticles that were incubated with these HeLa cells. And then by using a, a forehand recorded calibration curve, we can actually then deduce the temperature of the inside of those cells. So in case of erbium, because these two energy levels are so close to each other, we can actually use a Boltzmann governed distribution. And that's why we are having here our calibration curve that is plotted the logarithm of these intensity ratios as a function of one over temperature. So where could this, for instance, be interesting to use? And here I would like to highlight some work by Dani Hacke. So they investigated, for instance, surface temperature versus subcutaneous temperature. How can it be measured? For instance, if you want to monitor temperature during a thermal therapy. In this experiment, a 808 nanometer laser of high power density was used and shined on a mouse with the tumor here and injected nanoparticles in order to heat. And then this high power laser was switched off and it allowed cooling down. And during this cooling down period, they used another laser, 790 nanometer of lower power density in order to perform optical temperature sensing. So interestingly, what was found is that when you compare the readout of the temperature as a function of time, how it is cooling, the temperature that was measured with an infrared thermal camera, meaning the temperature on the surface of the mouth, was lower than that that was obtained through the nanothermometer using the subcutaneous luminescence. So this means by traditional approaches where you would just measure with an infrared thermal camera, you would get a lower than actual temperature. And if you see the temperature is so low, you may adjust your treatment to higher temperatures but it may be a risk to apply actually more heat than necessary for the photothermal therapy, risking then also to damage healthy tissue in the closed environment. And in contrast, using the subcutaneous luminescence based on nanothermometry gave a much more accurate local temperature sensing. What I also would like to mention here is that this was done using neodymium and ytterbium as the optical probe. And the reason was that those are actually giving near infrared emissions. So with the erbium green emission, we can, of course, it's good for, for cells, but we cannot go deep into tissue. With neodymium and ytterbium, we have emissions that are around 1,000 nanometers. So this is approaching the near infrared region. But ideally, we want to have this nanothermometry capability in the third biological window, means much longer than 1,000 nanometer. And um, here, we, this was still some work that was done when I was a postdoc with Johann Sovetone, and Artyom Skripka, the PhD student in the group, really finalized this work very nicely. So we had these core shell architectures of upconverting nanoparticles in different regions doped with different lanthanide ions that overall are giving us these many upconversion emission peaks. You recognize here maybe the green emission and the red emission of erbium. But wait, we want to do this in the biological window. So let's forget about the upconversion. This is not what we want. But the same nanoparticle, same architecture also allows us to trigger near infrared emission and the near infrared excitation. We have here the characteristic peak for holmium. We have here the characteristic peak for neodymium. And we have the one for erbium. And all this is in the second and in the third biological window between 1,100 and 1,700 nanometer. Now, if changing the temperature, what is really interesting is that if you compare the, um, the spectra recorded at 20 and 50 degrees, is that for the holmium peak, we have an increase in intensity. The same is happening for erbium, but in contrast, neodymium is actually decreasing. And what does this mean? This means that we have now two ratios that we can calculate between holmium and neodymium or between neodymium and erbium to give us a calibration curve that then can be used in order to measure temperature in the near infrared two and near infrared three region under near infrared excitation. So this was in fact the first example of pushing near infrared or of pushing nanothermometry that far into the near infrared biological window and also to perform it in, in aqueous media, which of course is important when aiming for biological applications. 
Now, as a note, the mechanism here is actually not the same Boltzmann governed uh, mechanism that I mentioned in case of the visible erbium emission. Instead, it is much more complicated. It's a lot of energy transfer between the different lanthanide ions, and we will not at all go into the mechanistic details here. But what I want to highlight is that this process is really solvent dependent. So these data were obtained when having the nanoparticles dispersed in water. If we disperse them in hexane, the way how these intensities are changing is completely different. And the reason becomes obvious when we are looking here at the energy levels of the um, vibrational modes of water, and in particular, the harmonic ones. So we see that there are some energy levels of vibrations of water that are very good match with energy levels of our lanthanide. So if water is closed around the nanoparticles, they can also be energy transferred to water which means that we depopulate some of the lanthanide states. And as soon as we are doing this, we are depopulating one, we promote the, or we foster the population of another level. This is all how these energy um, level related emission intensities will then change in different ways. So it's really important to keep in mind that thermal behavior is also very solvent dependent. Okay. So we have seen potential and challenges for bioimaging. We have seen those for bioassays. We have spoken about um, those remote controlled activations of, for instance, structural or photodynamic therapy with the potential and also with the challenges. How about nanothermometry? So it's great to be able to measure temperature. We rely on a ratiometric approach because then we are less dependent on effects of, for instance, um, concentration of the nanoparticles. We can probe the, the temperature at a very localized and small scale and maybe also monitor thermal therapy. So in the beginning of the, the um, the research in, in this field, it almost sounded like a perfect approach, but is it really? So there are two papers that I would like to highlight in this regard on the discussions. And again, they come out of the group from Professor Dani Hocke in Madrid. So there are very um, self-critical papers with respect to the community working in nanothermometry. Because indeed, what they point out in this paper from 2018 is that the authors would like to remark at this point that the possible variation of the signal induced, signal induced by excitation power density modification has been systematically ignored. So this is an important aspect because what they did is they chose a thulium doped nanoparticle that is emitting in the near infrared region. And we can see from the signal here that there are two peaks. And this means we can use the two peaks in order to obtain a ratiometric nanothermometer. However, as we can see from the spectrum here, is depending on how we choose the excitation power of our excitation light, this ratio is really changing. So it's plotted here. The intensity ratio is changing a lot with excitation power. And ultimately, what does this mean? This means that even if we know that our real temperature is not changing, the temperature that we are determining using our nanothermometer can be completely off as we change excitation power. And excitation power is not only changed by tuning the power knob on our laser, but also, for instance, if you shine the laser through different thicknesses of biological tissue. So there was really the, the um, we, it, it came really up from this study that we have to be careful about temperature uncertainties due to an uncontrolled change of on target power density. In the same paper, some other issues were mentioned, such as, for instance, it depends on which kind of numerical aperture you're using in your instrument, also um, absorption of light by, by tissue and self-absorption of emitted light by other nanoparticles can have similar effects that actually in the end tell us that our calibration curve might not be the correct one. And last but not least, very, very recently, just like one week ago, another paper came out by the same group where they um, implemented sim similar ideas in an in vivo scenario. And here as well, what we can see that if we are using lanthanide-based nanoparticles and we are looking at the emission in the near infrared region, it was compared how do these ratios or these peaks look like if we have either a nanoparticle dispersion in a cuvette or it is injected under the skin of a mouse. And you can see what a significant difference we are getting here. 
also, this does not only apply to lanthanide-based near infrared emitters, but also to other types of near infrared emitters, such as these AG2S quantum dots. And it is also proposed in the paper that the same may apply for near infrared emitters like single wall um, carbon nanotubes. So this work again really demonstrates that in vivo luminescence nanothermometry may indeed not be as reliable as the whole community thought before. But it is important to raise this awareness. So they report that errors of up to plus minus four degrees Celsius are possible by not having the right calibration curve. But on the other hand side, it is also shown that performing some correction on your calibration curve, taking into account different types of biological tissue can indeed help to overcome these difficulties here. All right, so if you want to be honest about potentials and challenges in also in nanothermometry, we have to at least here, where we have possible uh, difficulties with the reliability of the readout, the setup and the tissue, and we really must challenge our calibration curves, whether they are reliable for the different applications. So you can see that still in any of these potential applications, we still have a lot of challenges, but it's not all negative because also what we should not forget is that the field of upconverting and lanthanide based nanomaterials, near infrared emitters, upconverters is a relatively young research field. If you compare it to other research fields in inorganic materials or in photocatalysts or in organic chemistry. So it really started only like about 10 um, years ago that it is um, growing and getting more and more in. So I think that there is still a lot of um, room at the bottom in order to make new investigations and also to understand better the underlying mechanisms of these materials in order then to focus in the future only on the potential of those nanoparticles for biometrical applications. So allow me to finish with a couple of slides um, about the work that we are actually doing in, in my research lab and how we believe that we can contribute to this improved understanding of these nanomaterials, also making some new ones. So we focus a lot on material synthesis and we want to establish structure property relationships. So for instance, we are using a microwave assisted approach in order to synthesize these nanomaterials. Most of the examples that I have shown you today are prepared by a conventional thermal decomposition process that takes a little longer than just like minutes. But also a big difference is that the thermal decomposition process often gives nanoparticles in the right size range 20 to 40 nanometer. While in case of the um, microwave assisted synthesis, we are getting much smaller nanoparticles at a size range of about 10 nanometer. In both approaches, microwave and the conventional ones, typically trifluoroacetates are used as precursors for the lanthanides and also for the sodium. And they are decomposed in high boiling point solvents. They act as solvents, but also in particular the oleic acid and then also the oleolamine, they are also acting as capping agents on these nanoparticles. And in the literature, it had previously been reported that with the microwave, we can obtain the cubic phase of those materials. But remember, in the beginning, I said, if we are aiming for um, optical applications, we are more interested in getting the hexagonal beta phase. And at the beginning, this was really a struggle. So it took us some while, but then we figured out that it is actually this ratio between the gadolinium and the sodium source that we have to fine tune in order to now be able to selectively produce either the hexagonal beta phase or the cubic alpha phase of this type of nanoparticle. What we also found is that depending on what kind of precursor we are using, so either the trifluoroacetates or on the other hand side, um, oleates or acetates, we can have a, a way how to control particle size. For instance, with the trifluoroacetate, particles are typically in their um, sub 10 nanometer range, around seven nanometer in size. If we switch to those two precursors here, we are more at the sub uh, five nanometer range, more like around three nanometer plus minus. So then in the next step, we are always interested in looking at the optical properties, up conversion, near infrared emission, and also hyperspectral imaging. So this approach of tuning the um, gadolinium to sodium ratio to tune the um, to tune the phase of the nanomaterials also works very nicely to grow a protective shell. And then even these particles are still very small. So they are like overall just like 12 nanometer barely. 
they are small yet bright. So with a simple handhold laser pointer with 980 nanometer excitation, we can trigger this very bright emission that is characteristic for erbium. Now, here I'm showing you some particles that are obviously not nano, they are micro, and they are lithium yttrium chloride. So initially, we also wanted to prepare lithium yttrium chloride at the nanoscale because, as mentioned before, it is an interesting host material for the blue and UV emitting thulium for uh, photodynamic therapy or drug release, for instance. However, to our biggest surprise, we cannot just take um, lithium instead of sodium and yttrium instead of gadolinium, even though it looks to be like so close in terms of like the choice of elements. If we just change one element, nothing works the same as before. Also, even so, lithium yttrium chloride synthesis in conventional methods works perfectly. We cannot just like translate what works in conventional methods into the microwave. So this shows that lanthanides are kind of tricky little elements that each of them needs its own um, attention and really like fine tuning in order to understand how we have to tune our um, reaction conditions in order to get the properties that we want. Nonetheless, using chlorides in an, in an aqueous solution in the microwave gives, uh, gives us these nice near, in, um, sorry, these nice microparticles that now being at such a large scale, allow us to actually do single nanoparticle analysis of the optical properties using the hyperspectral image. Where we can really um, correlate the optical emission observed in the microwave with the position and the orientation of the microparticles observed in SEM. So as already previously mentioned in the beginning, we do not only have these optical properties, but also the magnetic properties. And here it's in particular the gadolinium that is of interest because this is active for MRI. It can be used as a contrast agent. And having on hand a synthesis approach, it gives us very small nanoparticles, like for instance, six, seven, eight nanometer, in selectively both of those crystalline phases, cubic and hexagonal, we actually investigated whether the cubic or the hexagonal would have a better performance as MRI contrast agents. And as we can see on those um, on those images here, on uh, on those um, phantom images here, we see that indeed the cubic nanoparticles give us a brighter contrast or brighter signal than the hexagonal one. This was on the one hand side ascribed to how surface functionalizing groups are binding to the surface and how protons from the water are then interacting with the gadolinium ion, but also on the other hand on the intrinsic magnetization of the material that is different for the hexagonal and for the cubic phase. So I believe that now we have here actually the, the possibility if we can tune further our host lattices influencing the magnetization this may give us a way how we can develop future more powerful MI contrast agents. Then also what has to be mentioned of course is that when aiming for biomedical applications we always need particles that are able to swim in water. So out of the reactor, they come with these caps of oleate groups, and this makes them dispersible in organic solvents like um, hexane or toluene. But we need to have something that is either surface modified um, to make them hydrophilic, or we need to have a nanoparticle that is not having any ligand on the surface. Because then we can do further functionalization with specific groups, for instance, targeting agents, drug molecules, etc. Typically, this stripping of the ligand is a very straightforward process. So we add a pH three to four, we can actually have reprotonation of the oleates kept on the nanoparticles and we obtain ligand-free nanoparticles and oleic acid again. Very well established approach. The only problem is that with our very small nanoparticles, we were not able to obtain an efficient way to transfer the nanoparticles either in the cubic or in the hexagonal phase from our organic solvent into water under these pH conditions. What we figured out was that we have to go to much harsher pH conditions like pH 2 or 1.5. Then it was indeed possible to bring all our nanoparticles from the organic solvent into the water phase. So far so good. But then we noticed that this only works for some of them. So for instance, when we took sodium gadolinium Chloride and it was in the hexagonal phase. Yes, we could obtain hexagonal phase sodium gadolinium chloride nanoparticles that were ligand free. However, if we had the same nanoparticles uh, but in the cubic phase, 
and he tried to bring them in water, he observed a phase transformation from sodium rare earth fluoride to the rare earth F3 phase. So this is in stark contrast to what always has been reported about the very good chemical stability of those materials. So maybe this should come as a reminder that also depending on which lanthanide we are using in our materials, sodium europium fluoride, sodium gadolinium fluoride, sodium prosodymium fluoride, we must be careful about the approach that we are using in order to bring our nanoparticles into the water phase because maybe they are not as stable as we always thought that they are. Okay, so what we also are looking at, not only in terms of the hyperspectral imaging to understand optical properties, but very recently we were able to acquire a, a new spectrofluorometer in our lab that now also allows us to look at lifetimes a quantum yield losing, using an integrating sphere and at temperature dependent processes in, in these optical materials. So temperature control can now be done between roughly 10 Kelvin and 380 Kelvin. And allow me to advertise a little bit. Um, so we have a very broad excitation module either for UV vis, that means not only for the lanternites, for the up converters, but also for, for dyes and other optical materials, but of course also the near and right excitation flexible sample holders, and also for the detection module from UV into the uh, near infrared and very long wavelengths we are able to detect our materials. Lifetimes are restricted to lifetimes that are rather long, like microseconds and milliseconds. In this way, it is um, really specialized for the, for the lanternite, but as already mentioned, quantum yield and temperature control is possible on any probe that can be excited with these wavelengths and is emitting here. So this instrument was just like um, installed and finalized a week or two before um, everyone was sent home to work in home office. And we now are desperately waiting to getting all back into the lab in order to do new measurements, to develop new probes and test their optical properties. And should you be interested in trying some of the features of this instrument, um, just be free and contact me. I would be very happy to, to talk with you. And with this, I come to the end. So I would like to acknowledge, of course, all students involved, previous and past. There were way more than that fine space on this slide here, collaborators, my current research group funding agencies, and of course, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Hammer, for the presentation. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I do. <laughs> Perfect. So uh, I have just a couple of questions here that came from the audience. I'd like to, I'd like to say, ask you some of these things. Uh, first question is from Alexander Steves. Uh, how does the sign of a multiplex lanthanide based imaging experiment for a bioassay look like? Are there any considerations that are unique versus the use of fluorophores in a technique such as laser scanning, confocal microscopy? Um, I would say the rough principles are very similar. So also for the bioassays based on upconverting nanoparticles, you have two different approaches. You can have them either um, heterogeneous assays or homogeneous assays. So it can either be um, the nanoparticles that are crafted on a, on a solid substrate, and then you are adding your analyte, but it can also be in a homogeneous form. So depending on which way you use, but the readout should be pretty much the same as far as I know for other essays. I hope this answers the question. All right, so uh, the uh, second question, uh, that'll come from me. Uh, so I'm more of a translational, uh, you know, closer to the clinical side type of uh, uh, bio, biomedical scientist. So my question is what potential application is close, do you think, to using this type of novel chemical approach on patients? Do you have any ideas of maybe close to clinical trials type of applications for this? Or I, I, I know that I saw some Dr. Rubison related uh, work and that's a, cancer, that's, a, that's a classic cancer treatment. Do you think that there's a close to, um, a close to clinical trials type of usage for this uh, chemical approach? Um, so, in principle, as said, so no, no, it's a relatively young field. So none of the nanoparticles, as I, as far as I know, are F, actually FDA approved. So which one could probably be the closest real-life application? On the one hand side, 
probably bioassays are really like the closest. If we are really going into clinical applications involved with patients, maybe this direction of um, where we would use the um, nanoparticles as um, in, 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 in uh, how to say, like in, in situ control probe during an operation. So if you have, you have in, the, in the operation room, you're removing a tumor and then you could spray these nanoparticles on the surface to make sure they would only attach to the cancer cells. And then with the near infrared light, you can clearly see where do you still have tumor tissue to remove or not. So I believe that some of those studies have actually been done in clinics. I'm not sure whether in Canada or in the US, but I have heard about some of those trials. But really on a daily life, I think we are still far away from it. All right, so our next question uh, also comes from uh, Alexander Steves. And uh, the question is, can these lanthanide particles be used as predictable uh, photo initiators in hydrogel uh, crosslinking. Yes, so there I have never worked with it, but there are studies. So in particular, if you take those not only in hydrogel but also in polymers. So if you need blue or green light, for instance, yes, it has been used. And then the idea, of course, is also you have, for instance, um, the you have to penetrate through um, some volume, and if you would need to penetrate through with the UV or blue or green light, this is difficult. But if you have your near infrared laser that can penetrate through, you reach better and maybe also more locally, where you can then trigger the, the gelation or the polymerization. And hydrogels are also um, some of the approaches that have been used, for instance, by the group of Professor Fiorenzo Vitone in collaboration with um, McGill University, where hydrogels are used uh, to be loaded with drugs, and then nanoparticles are used to actually open these and to release the drugs. Perfect. The uh, next question comes to us from uh, Dr. Akhil Jain from the University of Nottingham in the UK. And the question is what is the sensitivity of a hyper? spectral imaging system, of the hyperspectral imaging system? That's a very good question. Um, so um, the sensitivity, I, I'm not quite sure. So is it, uh, do you refer to the, the special resolution that we can get? So sensitivity, if it's just about um, whether you detect the light or not, this depends a bit on your, on your detector. So this is very good. So this is not what usually one has to worry about. There are systems that are able to detect signal emitters. Um, but, and also like the spectral resolution of the detectors is usually very good. So we can see really a nanometer um, spectral resolution. What is a problem, however, is the spatial um, resolution. Because there we are, of course, limited at the moment to the laws of physics. That we typically cannot observe smaller structures than the light that we are looking at. That's why with these hyperspectral images, images, unless you have very specifically constructed ones, you cannot see a single nanoparticle. So we can see our microparticles, but micrometer resolution, if we are lucky, in terms of spatial resolution. This is my guess. Of course, it's combined with confocality, so to make it better, but we are, there we are really limited. Yeah. All right. And uh, the Next question here is uh, from Dr. Marcelo Muniz from, uh, from the Beats Group at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. And he's asking, uh, what are the uh, toxic uh, effects of these products in, in human applications or the potential toxicity that could result from these uh, lanthanide-based uh, uh, materials when it comes to human applications, if any is known? Um, there are a couple of studies on, and in terms of this, the toxicity in both in in vitro, in cell lines, but also um, like in very simple in vivo organisms or in mice biodistributions. Um, overall, there is this belief that the materials are relatively stable. Uh, so usually um, they should not start leaching out because one could think, okay, if you have sodium gadolinium chloride, the gadolinium is leaching out, gadolinium is a heavy metal that is toxic. So this can be overcome by providing the right surface functionalization to avoid that this could happen, for instance, when the particles are taken up by macrophages, 
and facing an acidic environment where we could have these leakage of toxic ions. Overall, based on the studies that exist, the reports are in general that this toxicity is rather low. However, it's too early in my opinion to really say like it's absolutely safe. So on a personal opinion, I would rather take these lanthanide based nanomaterials than classical quantum dots in terms of toxicity, but it's, um, it's, it's too early stage to really say they are absolutely safe when under any conditions. So research, research is going on. <laughs> Perfect. Like you said, this is an uh, this is a young field that's uh, that's only uh, been taking off in the last ten years, and uh, we look forward to uh, how much more we get to learn uh, about this uh, as as the years uh, and as uh, our situation worldwide gets back to normal uh, science uh, output. Uh, I think this, uh, to respect time, I think this will be it for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Eva Hammer, for joining us today on this uh, virtual science seminar uh, series. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, uh, like we said, uh, th this, uh, this presentation will be available on the Beats Research uh, Radio YouTube channel. Uh, and, uh, and thank you so much for, for joining us today. And we look forward to more of these. And uh, uh, I'll end by saying, stay safe and uh, good luck. Thank you very much to you. <laughs> and the same to everyone. Thank you so much.